morning. Thank you very much for showing up here. We have lots of people online too. We have some, I don't know, 10, 15 people here in the room and 70 plus people online. Um, let's start, nice morning. We have several updates. Um, I know that we have some major updates probably from uh, accounting. They would be here soon, but let's not, uh, let's keep going. Um, I think the first presentation would be um, by the executive director of animal care programs regarding teaching and research and animal care. So, Lori. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Lori. Okay, let's see if I can navigate this guy and this guy, right? Okay. And we're up there. Look at you go. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and to all of you online. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Lori Brignolo. I am the executive director for our research and teaching animal care program. And my goal today is to sort of present just a very quick overview of what our animal care program is here at UC Davis and sort of how it relates to um, our research program overall. So just starting with um, a little bit of, of background as the executive director of our program here. It's a brand new position here on campus. It, it hasn't existed before November of last year when, when I came on board with it. So we're, we're still kind of navigating exactly what that's going to mean for us. But globally, what I would like to tell folks is if anything goes wrong with a researcher teaching animal here on campus, it's ultimately my fault. So I try, I take that very seriously and try to be very professional about it. But I, my goal is to know every little thing about our program. So when folks kind of start asking me, well, why are you asking this? It's because ultimately I need to know because if anything goes wrong, it's uh, kind of on my shoulders there. So that said, let's go ahead and, and talk a little bit about what our program means to us. So one of the first things that we did coming on board establishing this is just establishing very clear vision and mission statements. So our vision, pretty straightforward, right? We want to ensure that people and animals live healthier lives while utilizing both judicious and respectful um, mechanisms with our animal models. It's our animal care program's job to make certain that that is happening. And along with that, we want to foster a culture of excellence. Big, big emphasis for us. We want to have an excellent program. We want to be a leader in the nation with what our animal care program does. So we want to support both our animals and those folks that are working with our animals and relying on them for their science. Okay, this is what our program looks like. So for, can we see the, the, the total top part? So basically what we've got is 46 different units on campus that house animals in one way, shape or form. The 46 different units um, are quite varied in their size. So for instance, tracks, for those of you who are familiar with that, we've got over 100 different animal rooms. They count as one of those programs. The Primate Center, which is also huge on acres of land and has over 4,000 monkeys, they count as one. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we've got some very small ones that may just have a room with a couple of tanks of fish or a room with a rack of mice or something along those lines. But they're all considered separate units within our program. It's just kind of giving you a feel for some of the scope. We are all over the Davis campus. So these big circles and shapes kind of outline different areas where animal housing facilities are. And each of those teeny little dots represents one of those potentially 46 different units. But this only encompasses the Davis campus. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of our animal care program that's beyond Davis and the Sacramento campuses as well. So it includes, like I said, all of the research and teaching animals that are housed both on and off campus. It's our 46 different units. We call them vivaria. Vivaria is basically a place that houses animals. Um, it's over 250 buildings total, 300 or so outdoor pens and pastures, over a million square feet of space. So it's big, lots of animals, lots of space, lots of people involved. So of those 46 different units, we talked about being Sacramento and the Davis campuses. So 35 of those are, are kind of in our area here proper. 12 of them house rodents. I think most of us, when we think about um, research and teaching animal, we're probably thinking about rodents, rats and mites as our most common, right? Really, it's a pretty low number for us as a campus. 
So 12 different units housing rodents, four of those are investigator maintained. So that means that you're an investigator, you've got some sort of scientific reason that you should be taking care of those animals. It may be a space issue, it may be the type of rodent that you're working with requiring some special husbandry that maybe your research group has the best expertise on, something along those lines. <laughs> 16 of them house aquatics. Mostly those are fish, some of them are frogs. But you'll see that's the highest ranking in the, the number of vivaria that are dedicated to one particular species. We have more fish, research and teaching fish on campus than we have any other species. <clears throat> chickens, we have a lot of chickens on campus, five different facilities that, that will house chickens for us. Four different ones that are housing horses that are part of our research and teaching program. Most of them for teaching, not as much for research, but they're, they're all part of it. And in three different departments, all different reasons, all different SOPs, different, different reasons for having them here. Four different places for cats, two different places for monkeys. So I'm just trying to give you a feel for the diversity, the complexity, and kind of how big and maybe a little bit messy we are as a, as a program there. Then we talked about the ones that are off campus, right? So of those 46 different units, we talked about the 35 that are within us. We've got a feedlot that's down in El Centro. It's about 10 miles north of the Mexico border, way, way down there, but it's technically part of our program. So our IACUC is responsible for um, doing an inspection there every six months. So we fly down to, to El Centro. The February inspection isn't so bad. It's about 85, 90 degrees in. We're gonna head down in August. It'll be about 120. It's not the funnest place to be in August, but it's, it's part of our program. So we go and we take a look. <clears throat> Rangelands on <and> prison land. <laughs> it's, it's really a perfect blend. You know, the land's there. It's got all this great security around it already, not for our cows, but we kind of take advantage of it. Is that, that as part of that process? The Bodega Bay Marine Lab, that's part of our program. Those of you who haven't been there, it's really phenomenal. You should um, take advantage of it if you can. We have a small rodent facility down in, um, in San Bernardino. And we have this fascinating program at the Caldecott Tunnel. So it's, it's a small little trailer. It's got two units set up where animals can, or rodents can be housed inside. And they're really looking at the, uh, the exposure that people are getting when they're going under that tunnel. They're looking at the, the gases from the, the cars going through and it's right there and it's on site. So pretty amazing stuff. Over 500 different investigators, lots and lots of different people. I know you guys interact with many of them on, on a different level than we do from an animal care program. 3,000, over 3,000 support staff. So that's the people that are taking care of the animals every day, the people that are working with the animals as research, the people that are dealing with the cages that are dirty afterwards, all of those sorts of things. It takes a lot of people. So I put up over 1,500 animal care protocols. I think we're at 1,531, 1,538. It's an ever-changing number. So those of us who are in animal care programs look at that and we're like, Oh my God, that's a lot of protocols. You all probably are like, well, whatever, right? You have all these grants coming through way more than that. But from an animal program perspective, this is probably second only to maybe the NIH, something like that. It's, it's a huge number of different protocols. So for our infrastructure, our IACUC staff, it's, um, it's a big deal. Yeah. And we're very proud of that as well. Let's see, what else do I have here? Oh, let's talk about the scope and the numbers. So we talked about the number of fish, right? Right now, not on campus we have this many, but as far as those 1500 protocols that we were talking about, the number of animals that they may cover for the research and teaching reason, or purposes, 4.5 million fish. That's a lot of fish, right? Most of them are teeny little zebra fish, they're about this big. So they don't take up a ton of space, but there's a lot of them and each and every one needs to be accounted for in these protocols. 500,000 frogs, uh, 83,000 mice, from a, from a mouse research perspective, that's not a lot. We're not a big mouse house. So let's see, um, UC San Francisco, for, exist, for example, they have about four times as many mice as we do. It's, it's, we're not big, we have a lot of them, but from the, the grand scheme of things, <coughs> excuse me, it's not that many. 4,100 non-human primates. That number is actually higher right now because we're in the middle of baby season. So we've had a lot that are, that are on the ground. Um, and it varies as, as the year goes by. We have a primate center. That's why we're one of, we, we have those numbers. So most animal care facilities don't have those numbers of non-human primates at all. 
comparison, you see San Francisco right now, they have three monkeys. We've got 4,100, right? Cows, <laughs> we have a dairy. We have lots of research cows. These numbers here, they all seem um, pretty high from a, uh, a large animal program perspective. Many of these are in clinical trials. So we may be doing feed trials at um, dairies down in Tulare. Those numbers are gonna be counted here because they're covered under our animal care protocols as well. Horses, sheep, cats, cats as well, that number um, is, is pretty high because it counts clinical trials. So um, maybe you have a cat that has cancer and just like the IBC covers clinical trials in humans, we have a clinical trial program for um, pets and for large animals to go through experimental treatments to see if we can develop new treatment modalities for different, different types of things. Now that said, we do have about 200, 200 cats that we have on campus. We have an SPF, which is a specific pathogen-free colony that we maintain for um, nutrition purposes. So we do, it's called AVCO testing. So the diets that you buy in the pet store or in the grocery store or whatever for your, your cats, they have this whole series of testing they need to go through to make certain that they're appropriate for your animals. And we do those testings for different um, food companies there. Okay, grant dollars. This is probably where a lot of you, you can kind of can chime in. You're more familiar with it from, from that end. So 23.6% of the grant dollars that come into UC Davis involves some form of animal research. Not necessarily that dollar figure goes towards the animal research part of it, but the grant dollars coming in involving those types of grants, uh, it's a pretty significant percentage. So just the numbers from last year, Ahmad, thank you for getting those for me. They've been, they've been very helpful for these presentations. Okay, 325 FTE covering animal care. These are the boots on the ground people that day in and day out are feeding, cleaning up after the animals, making certain their cages are appropriate, making certain they've got plenty of feed, making certain that their health is being assessed and if they have any sort of health issues, that they're reporting it to our veterinary staff. We've got 33 different veterinarians throughout campus that are dedicated to working with our research and teaching animals. Many of them are part of Campus Vet Services, so that's the unit that I maintain. Our animals, <coughs> sorry about that. Our animals, um, or our staff rather, is, are covering the vast majority of the research and teaching animals here on Davis proper. The mice, the cats, the dogs, um, some of the sheep, those sorts of things. The primate center vets are counted in this as well. They have a separate veterinary staff that are just working with those animals. And then we also have um, the Veterinary Medical Teaching Hospital field services. They're responsible for our, all of our ag animals. So they're gonna take care of the, the sheep at the sheep barn, the horse at the horse barn, the horses at CEH, those sorts of things. Nine of our vets are ACLAM diplomats. So what that means is that those vets are board certified in laboratory animal medicine. So it's kind of a big deal for us to have that number. So structure wise, <coughs> sorry guys, we've got a tickle here. Structure wise, we've got three different things that are part of an animal care program that are a necessity. So we've got an institutional official. So Prasant serves that role for us right now. He's ultimately the person that's responsible for the animal care program. He's what we call the go to jail guy. So if any of us does something really egregious or super horrible, he's really the one that's gonna take the fall. So ultimately, he's gotta keep his fingers in on all of this and make certain he's aware of what's going on. The attending veterinarian, that's my role. We talked about that already. And then, um, then we've got the IACUP. So we've talked about that and what they're responsible for as far as the, the oversight of the program, the oversight of the facilities. We have a large committee. We've got 26 people on that committee. It's mainly faculty driven. It's a very large committee when you're comparing programs. And then we have our director, Donna Rowley, who's here in the room with us, and our assistant director, Director Whitney Petrie. Regs and guidelines, just so everybody knows, these are sort of the, the big picture things that we're following. The Animal Welfare Act covers mammals with the exception of mice and rats. So the vast majority of animals, oh, and fish, they don't cover them either. The vast majority of our research animals don't fall under this purview. The USDA comes to us with unannounced inspections. They're supposed to be here at least once a year and they're supposed to look at all of the USDA covered animals on campus. Their way of kind of making certain that we're doing what we're supposed to do are both financial and legal. So they can fine us if we're doing something that we're not supposed to be doing 
or um, because it's covered under the Animal Welfare Act, which is a law and that has the animal welfare regulations, <coughs> then um, there may be some legal ramifications if there are issues there. Public health service policy, they're the ones that are, are keeping track or it's the guidance for any animals that are covered for with um, NIH funding or national funding and they're administrated by OLA. And then ALAC. So I don't know how many of you have been hearing about ALAC coming through the pikes here, but we're, we're scheduled for our triennial site visit here in the fall. So we're, we're all anxious and getting, spending lots of time on our, our program description and getting, getting ready for this. So they come to us once every three years. It's technically a voluntary program, but UCAOP says that everybody that's part of the UC system has to be accredited. So it's not really voluntary for us, but that's okay. Um, there are currently approximately a thousand accredited facilities worldwide. This is a worldwide organization. We were first accredited in 1966. ALAC started in 1965. They keep track of that thousand or so um, organizations by the number. It's actually sequential and we're number 29. So we were the 29th institution in the United States then to become ALAC accredited. Those are our dates. Actively counting down. Program descriptions due in eight days. We'd be so glad we're not as submitted. <laughs> and then um, I, I, I made the mistake a few months ago of putting one of those calendar apps on my phone that tracks down when ALAC is showing up. That was a bad decision on my part. It, it reminds me every day. I was like, guess what? Okay, ALAC. It follows this guy. This is, this is our Bible, right? Basically, to become ALAC accredited, we need to do what it's saying in here. This, this is my display copy. My actual copy has tabs and highlights and, and pages you know, turned over and that sort of thing. So um, it, gets, it gets used regularly. It looks like kind of a, a teeny little book there. It's, it's given, um, it's outlined in must, should, and may statements. The must statements in there, there's 49 of them, not, not a ton. Um, but really, if you wanna be ALAC accredited, you absolutely have to do what it says you must do, right? It's pretty straightforward. The shoulds you have a little bit more flexibility with and the maze even more there. So our, our goal as we're writing our program description and looking at our program is to make certain that we're doing all of the musts for sure. Most of the shoulds unless we have a good scientific reason not to and the maze we're looking at from a sort of a different perspective. Just to give you a feel for what campus has done since our last ALAC site visit we built this amazing, amazing facility. So it's a cage wash facility, and it's responsible for all of those animal cages we were talking about, those numbers of cats, dogs, fish, mice, all of those things. Those cages need to be cleaned on a regular basis, according to this guy here, with what frequency we, what frequency we need to do it. Um, and then this has been uh, a campus-wide investment so that we can both improve efficiencies um, and then be able to actually take down some of the cage wash facilities that we had that were really inefficient and costing campus more money. So we've taken two down. Ultimately, the goal is to take down a couple more and go from there. Sadly, this building is already out of space. <laughs> it was one of those things when we put forth the original plans, it was value engineered is the term I think we were told into something much smaller than we had anticipated or we were actually hoping for. So hopefully we'll be able to do some expansions on that. And then part of the animal care program is our rodent health surveillance. So those rodents that we were talking about, even though they're not a ton in comparison to other facilities, we need to make certain that they are absolutely the best animal models possible for our investigators. And a lot of that just means that they're healthy, coming into us healthy, staying healthy when they're part of a program. And um, there's a lot of work that goes into that. It's, a, it's basically a, a full-time person keeping track of those animals, keeping track of the room order, making certain that, you know, if you've got your, we call them the super clean animals that come in and maybe they're on your cancer studies or on your, um, transplantation studies, something along those lines that need to stay super clean from a rodent health perspective, not being exposed to mouse viruses basically, and then following that room order across campus. Oh, talk about just some of the changes there and what our program is. These things probably mean nothing to you, but you can imagine if these little creatures are on your mice, that's probably not the best, best thing for your research purposes. So we absolutely wanna make certain that none of those are, are part of our program. 
this is just one of my favorite posters and it's kind of what I turn to, you know, those days that you're having a bad day, you're kind of wondering, oh, why am I here? What am I doing? This is absolutely why we're here. So you can thank research and animal research in particular for a million different things. But just some of the basics that we talk about here are allergy medicines, um, your grandmother getting a new hip. You know, all of these things were tested on animals in one way, shape, or before, before they came to us, or before they came to our pets as form as treatment, um, as part of treatment modalities. I think that's all I had. Are there any questions? All right, well, thank you very much. I know I talked over my apologies. Thank you very much, Lily. Oh, I need this guy too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Again, thank you, Lori. And I'm sure you guys know that um, um, animal care program didn't used to be a part of uh, Office of Research up to, until a couple of years ago or so. March, March, 2018. March 2018, they joined us, and that's a, an excellent addition to the Office of Research. Um, so with that, um, James, do you want to go next, or do you want to wait? No problem. So that means Kelly on the proposal side would go next. Thank you. Good morning. We just have a couple of quick reminders about the proposal process for everybody this morning. Um, we want to take a moment to remind everybody to please utilize proposals at ucdavis.edu for general questions about the proposal process or maybe proposals that are going to be routed over. Um, we really strive to provide excellent customer service and by using that email address it will really help us be most efficient in responding to the questions quickly while still focusing on the proposals that have already been assigned and that are due, you know, immediately. Um, so it's staffed around the clock, you know, eight to five by myself um, and our officers, Krista Hicks and Vaughn and Elisa Bunn. And usually responses are, are, are issued pretty quickly within an hour or so, um, sometimes a little bit longer, uh, but that's really going to be the most efficient way for people to get those general questions answered. Um, we have a couple of Cayuse reminders. Um, we wanna remind everybody that when something is routed to us, it doesn't mean that we receive it right away. Depending on the number of departments involved, it can actually take a day, two days, sometimes even more than that to get the request to us. So we ask that you keep that in mind when you are submitting proposals and when you're setting deadlines. Um, just keep in mind that that can take some time. Um, additionally, please keep your eye on the routing of those proposals. We're not alerted that they're routing over to us. So if something gets stuck, we're oftentimes not aware until a department contacts us and asks us, what's the status of this proposal? So it's always a good idea for departments to kind of keep their eye on the routing chain um, to see where things may be held up. And if there's an issue, contact us so we can work with you to resolve it. Um, and then last but not least, it would be incredibly helpful for us when you're submitting your proposal if you give us access to review the submission package in 424 or Fastlane. Um, a lot of times we're seeing that people are submitting the documents that are required in SP, which is great. We're able to do a full review of the budget and budget justification, but we're not getting access in 424 or Fastlane until the last minute. Uh, so, for example, last week I had a proposal that was due, and I had a full five days to review everything in Cayuse SP, but I didn't get the 424 package until 10 minutes before it was due. So, all I had time to do was review the budget and the, the overall dollar figures and submit it. There's so much more we could have done to make sure that that proposal could have been submitted, you know, and was accurate if we had additional time. So, when thinking about full reviews, please remember to give us access, at least read-only access in those systems. That doesn't mean the science and technical pieces have to be complete, but as much as you can give us for budget, key personnel, budget justification, that would be terrific. On the issue of uh, timing, the example you used 10 minutes before the deadline, uh, please also Remember that if we are that close to the deadline, the chance of things not going through increase. Uh, computers don't always behave as you expect them to behave. Uh, connections would not get north, would go down. So, uh, and we have been there. We have not missed proposal deadlines because of those issues. 
and unfortunately, like you no know, PIs have worked on it for I don't know five six months, uh, lots of time and energy, and deadline is missed because of the fact that we didn't get the access, you know, long enough before the proposal. So that's very important too. Anything else you have? That is it for proposals, unless anyone has any questions for me. I don't see any questions online. Okay. And remember, this is these sessions are you not know, designed for you guys to ask questions from us. So hopefully, I, the fact that there are no questions, it means that you know, everything is very clear. <laughs> hopefully. Thank you. So next, um, how about uh, award? And Grace is going to give us some updates on that. Okay, I have a little PowerPoint with a few web, web links. All right, there we go. All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Grace Liu. I'm associate director on the awards side here in sponsored programs. Okay, turn on the clicker. There we go. The first one is UCOP has put out an industrial hemp FAQ. So if you have any questions like what are the requirements for conducting clinical trials with hemp or hemp derived compounds such as CBD, now you have some guidance on the UCOP website, and they have a lot of different questions that have come up. So I highly encourage you to take a look at that if, if you, you know, for anyone in ag or medicine who might be using industrial hemp or compounds derived from that. Oops. And also UCOP has reached a <clears throat> template agreement with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation we were not processing those awards for a while, so now we can. If you have an award that's being held, we can now process that. So just to, just to let you know that those projects can now go forward. And another thing is, I hope you guys are looking at some of the press releases from the, from, from the funding agencies. They contain a lot of really great information, such as the focus certain agencies are taking, um, certain big funding opportunities that are released. So I include the links to some of our big agencies like NIH, NSF. They, they're sorted by months. So you can just go through and look at all the different press releases or publicity releases from these agencies. They contain a lot of really great information. And okay, that's all I have. Is there anything else on awards? Any questions? Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you. James, you don't have a choice anymore. <laughs> Come on over. James representing extra VR accounting yeah, or contracts and grants accounting. Sorry, well, good morning, everybody. Um, all I have to say is fiscal close is done. Oh. For the most part, so our staff in contracts and grants accounting are now back on normal duties and trying to get everything processed uh, as promptly as possible. So that's um, that's my big um, announcement from contracts and grants accounting. So anybody that wants to ask me anything specific to CGA needs to do it right now. No, okay. Well, they missed their <laughs> chance. Okay, but um, but. Uh, one thing that is on the horizon that is really, uh, it's coming in really quick um, is the UC PATH implementation. And I've invited a couple of uh, members of the UC PATH team to come over and share some information that's really uh, related to contracts and grants award administration. So hopefully you'll find this information interesting and uh, we'll kind of go from there. Uh, so we have Kristen Pereira and Teresa Schumacher, are you coming up, Teresa? Are you going to, you're, you're going to say, well, okay, well, Kristen is going to stand in front of the camera and use the microphone. Oh, no. CNG private gift, is it normal for them to receive, she means grants, is it, excuse me. Excuse Start me. again. Is it normal for CNG private grants to receive STIP income? If the agreement indicates that we will be, um, you know, 
uh, any interest earned by that agreement will go to the agreement and to that project, it would accrue still. And it is not typical. I, well, I can't think, of, think about any grant um, at this point that would have that restriction. STIP doesn't belong to the pro project, it belongs to the campus, I believe. And more specifically, chancellor's discretion. Is that how it goes? I need to go double check it. I think we have some that we are still recording stiff into okay. the private grants, but the, the number could be you know, yeah, dwindling like, rapidly. Like, yeah. yeah. Any, okay. Any other questions? Nope. Oh. Okay. One more. Huh? Uh, go ahead. What's the comment? BMFG has stiff income. Okay. Okay, let's go. Okay. <laughs> Without further ado, here's Kristen from the UC Path team. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, like James was saying, Teresa and I work on the UC Path project and we work on the finance side of the project. And so um, we've put together this presentation for you to start introducing some of the things um, that we think you should be paying attention to and be sort of prepared for when we get to, um, when we go live. I think the cursor's not active on the. Oh. There we go. Thank you. All right. So um, as you can imagine, UC Path is a humongous project, and there are many facets to this project. But really, we've tailored this presentation to this audience and what we think research administrations would like to know and start introducing these concepts to you. So of course, we are going live um, at the end of September. So it's right around the corner. Um, so we want to make sure that we start introducing these concepts to you. Um, I would also put a plug in there, um, town halls being conducted. So if you go to our website, ucpath.edu, ucdavis.edu, um, there's a plethora of information, but they're starting to have town halls. And I would encourage everyone to attend a, a town hall. I think they're all available by Zoom um, to start um, as for your role as a research administrator, but also your role as an employee. Um, this affects all of us. So um, it's good to um, educate yourself to, to be prepared for these changes that are coming. But for today's presentation, we're going to be talking about um, assessments, talking about assessment redirects, which will be replacing benefit diversions, cost transfers, uh, salary caps and how they'll work in UC Path, um, E-Verify funds, um, encumbrances, and then I'm going to give a brief overview of how our ledger entries are going to be changing. All right, so let's start with assessments. Um, the CBR rates, um, if you're not aware already, the rate structure is changing. So um, when we go uh, with UC Path, there will be 14 rates. Um, and the rates are determined by business units. So UC Path, in UC Path, we will have three business units. We'll have a unique business unit for Davis Campus, Davis Medical Center, and a &R. So each of those entities can develop their own CBR rates. For VLA, we will have three rates. There's a rate for non-accruing, which of course would be zero, um, accruing, which is everybody else, and then there's a, this special third rate for fiscal year faculty, because they are just different enough that they get their own rate. And then with Gale, um, campus is moving to a single rate with a single object code, and that's a new object code, so you'll start seeing that on your ledgers as well. <laughs> Um, a and R will have three rates. So again, because UC Path allows us to configure this by business unit, um, it allows A and R to have um, a, separate, a separate rate structure than um, campus. So for those of you who are administering grants for A and R, you'll just have to um, switch your brain <laughs> when you're thinking about um, your populations there. Um, one thing to note about assessments is when the assessments are applied. And it's not necessarily intuitive. So um, you can see, of course, reg time um, for HSCP, faculty, XX prime, and Y. All of those kinds of um, compensations are assessed CBR. But you'll notice something that is um, glaring um, is that at the bottom here, we have vacation and PTO is not assessed. So when someone has vacation or PTO hours, CBR will not be assessed on that portion. Any questions there? 
about assessments. Okay. Assessment redirects. So UC Path um, will, the functionality is called redirect and that will replace our current benefit diversion. So if any of you do have awards that restrict um, benefit expenses or tuition remission on that grant and you have to find, um, move those expenses onto an alternative fund source, um, we'll be using the redirect functionality in UC Path. Um, a couple things to note about this functionality. Um, our PNI, which is the UCRP Supplemental Interest, um, this is something that may not be totally visible to you today, but it will be in the future. It will be a separate assessment and you'll be able to see it as a distinct assessment. It is exempt from federal and federal flow through funds, so you won't see it on those funds. But when you do have it, um, it is not eligible for redirects. Um, Gail uh, does have an exemption. So again, if you have a fund source that's exempt from Gail, it will just be exempted. You don't have to redirect it. It just will not be assessed like it, as it is today. Um, and the way that we maintain redirects is that we here at location at UC Davis don't have access to go into UC Path and program these redirects. We actually have to go to the UC Path Center. So unfortunately, it will take more steps. Today, it's very direct. You go into KFS and you enter your benefit diversions. In the future, it's going to be a longer process because you do have to go first through our UC Davis point of contact and then um, our point of contact will uh, forward it on to the UC Path Center who will then directly enter that into UC Path. Okay, let's talk about cost transfers. This is, I know, a hot topic. Um, there are three flavors of cost transfers. And when we go live with UC Path, cost transfers are being processed in UC Path and will no longer be processed in KFS. So the salary cost transfer, and um, it has the unfortunate label in UC Path as direct retro, which can be misleading, I think, but it is the salary cost transfer functionality in UC Path. Um, and those cost transfers do accommodate those work study um, um, adjustments. So if you need to make an adjustment to the splits, the um, salary cost tra transfer will accommodate that. Um, it, if you have HSCP faculty, it accommodates those multiple components of pay. And if you have folks on salary caps, it accommodates that as well. So all of that is all bundled in within this UC Path salary cost transfer. Um, the second flavor um, in, on the project, we call it pre-go-live salary cost transfers. And what that really means is that um, no pay history is being brought into UC Path. So if you have, at, at the time of go live, you need to perform a salary cost transfer for pay that was initiated in PPS, we'll still have to go back to the KFS SET to do those salary cost transfers because UC Path will have no knowledge of that prior pay prior to our conversion. So um, the SET will be available for some period of time after go live, um, but it will be limited. Um, and then at some point it will be uh, turned off. So just be mindful of if the pay was initiated in UC Path, you do the salary cost transfer in UC Path. If, it's, um, if the pay was initiated in PPS, then you would do go to your SET to do that cost transfer. And then the third one, I think not a lot of people know about this functionality. It's benefit cost transfers. And again, KFS has this functionality today. It may be invisible to you because only contracts and grants accounting in the central payroll office have access to actually perform these transactions, but you may be familiar with it if you have had, um, for example, a benefit diversion go awry and you needed to um, have a correction, um, you probably requested um, this kind of transfer from, from contracts and grants accounting and they went in and did the benefit cost transfer. That will be true in the future um, and contracts and grants accounting will have access to these benefit cost transfers in UC Path. Um, a change with salary cost transfers are the federal 120 day and 90 day rules. So um, we know that there's a restriction on transferring um, onto federal funds after 120 days from the initial transaction. And in today's world, you cannot initiate that on the KFS SET. In UC Path, you can. But we still have the business process whereby you have to get approval from the Contracts and Grants Office to do this type of transaction. Um, so even though the system is allowing you, we have this approval workflow in the system where you at department could initiate the cost transfer. It gets approved at the department, but if it meets this criteria, it will be routed to someone in Contracts and Grants Accounting to be approved. Um, and if you haven't gotten that pre-approval, it will be denied. 
So um, that approval process about going to the Contracts and Grants Office still remains the same, and that should occur prior to you going into the system and entering that salary cost transfer. Any questions about cost transfers? Yep. Great. Okay. Okay. So our questions are, will direct retro allow transfers between object consolidations, e.g. transfers between sub S and sub G? It will not. So similar to the KFS SET, you cannot transfer between object consolidation object codes. Um, so once the original transaction has been assigned, for example, sub S or sub G, um, then uh, it will remain. The SET is not a mechanism to be able to transfer that code. No more questions. Okay, so um, next question is, will benefits and related charges move in proportion to the salary that is moved like it does in KFS? That's a great question and I should have covered that. Yes, it does. So you're in, on the screen, you'll be transferring the actual pay um, and then the, the benefits and assessments behind the scenes will, will follow. And then one more question. We have a current NIH postdoc fellowship award and benefits diversion has been set up. Will this be affected by UC PATH? It will, and in fact, so um, when we transition into UC PATH and use the, the redirects rather than the benefit diversions, we are actually transferring every benefit diversion that is in KFS today and loading it into UC PATH. In the future, it will be your responsibility to go through the process that we talked about, but um, um, it, we, if there's something in, the, in KFS today, we are loading it into UC PATH, so when we go live with UC PATH, it should be active. All right, and we have another one. Is there a way to fix object codes? Not in UC Path. Unfortunately, I know today we have that the workaround where I think people are processing EDLRs, which is um, uh, our only mechanism that's available to us, but it's not really appropriate. Um, so, so in the future, UC Path does not accommodate um, moving from one object consolidation to another. All right, this is a popular topic. So we have another question sure. that just came in. <laughs> Usually it's James, so he got lucky today so far. Uh, for, for the SCT, are the current forms with signatures no longer needed and streamlined with UC PATH? Um, I'm not sure, um, maybe James can help me with the signature. Is it for the 120 day rule? Yeah. Yeah, the process the transfer form, you're trying to nail down I spoke too soon, James. <laughs> Effectively, yeah, it'll be something very similar. We're going to get uh, exactly what we want to have you submit to us for approval before you submit the, uh, the cost transfer through UC Path. Uh, like Kristen said, the, the plan is if you have not attached this documentation with our prior approval, we're just going to kill it because we don't have time to go back and forth, I guess. Okay. Um, May I sit down? <laughs> any more questions? Anything for James or any more on cost transfers? Okay, we'll go back to the presentation. There's also the, the salary cost transfer form in, in UC Path has actually a questionnaire that has, I think it's five questions that are those standard questions that you will have to answer within the um, document itself and attach the pre-approval. <laughs> Doesn't want to move. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Thanks. And I think can you click in the slide again? Okay. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So salary caps. Um, you are already familiar with KFS already making the enhancement to accept salary caps greater than just NIH salary caps. Um, and that was in anticipation of the UC PATH functionality. So these are all of the um, sponsors who have been recognized as having um, salary caps and they are configured within UC PATH so that when you're entering your funding distributions or your salary cost transfers, those salary caps are accommodated. Additionally in UC PATH, um, so UC PATH is knowledgeable about these because KFS is telling UC Path this account and fund is subject to caps. And it assumes that it has the most recent 
um, cap rate. But if you have someone who is subject to a cap rate, a prior cap rate that is not the recent cap rate, you can actually change that. It's not free form. You can't enter any amount that you want. It's a drop down and it gives you every um, past rate for that agency um, so that you can apply a different cap rate if it's appropriate for your, your um, employee. And um, of course, effort reporting is taken into consideration and those over the cap amounts do not count towards effort. All right, E-Verify. Um, if you have um, awards that are subject to E-Verify, um, that functionality is within UC Path. Um, and if you use an account in the distribution or in the salary cost transfer, the user will get a warning. And it doesn't stop you, it doesn't make you do anything, it doesn't make you sure that E-Verify happened. You can continue with your transaction. However, it's, um, it's like a courtesy warning so that I think sometimes, um, the person doing the entry doesn't may not know that this was a subject to, funding subject to E-Verify, um, and that probably an, an additional step outside of the system needs to um, occur where you ensure that that employee has been E-Verified before um, paying them from this funding source. And we will have a uh, report that's available that where you can compare whether someone has been E-Verified and if they're on E-Verify funding. So to help you manage that work. encumbrance reporting. This is another hot topic. So um, the way you may not be aware, but the way that um, we have encumbrances today is that PPS actually calculates them for us and relieves them um, once the actual pay occurs. Um, UC Path does not offer that same functionality to us. Um, early on, um, when we did outreach to um, folks, folks said, nah, that's okay. We don't need to replicate it. And then we so we came to one of our um, Change Network forums where maybe, I don't know, 500 people were listening, which was a much broader sampling. And when we said we're not providing encumbrance anymore, there was quite an uproar. So we heard it loud and clear, um, uh, which again, it was um, different than the messages that we had been hearing prior to that. So we kind of... Um, didn't, we ended up not having a lot of time to solve this solution. So we're, we're taking a two-pronged approach. So we have a near-term solution for encumbrances, which is um, a Cognos report. So um, if any of you use DS, uh, PPS DS reports today, um, those PPS DS reports are being replaced by um, the Cognos tool and we'll have new reports. So we will provide a report that displays encumbrances, but it'll just be a single report with encumbrances. Um, we know that what I think everyone really needs for their business need is to be able to access those encumbrances and pull them into their, like for their FIS DS2 report, or I think that's where they are. Um, but basically to have those encumbrances available to multiple reports and not just be a single standalone report. Um, so I did wanna bring this to this audience because I think this is probably the heaviest user of um, encumbrances in your reporting and so, um, this, this single report that we'll be providing is, we call it a day two report. And that means it will not be available the day we go live with UC Path. Um, we have many reports identified that won't, won't be ready on day one. And there's a committee that will prioritize in which order those reports get developed. So I can't say if it's the second month or the third month because it depends on this committee's work and when they prioritize it but it will be available. But in the meantime, I think for those of you who are doing reporting, um, and, and this, if you, this is an integral part of your reporting, you might need to think about a workaround um, between the go live date and um, when this report becomes available. I'm gonna pause for a minute because I'm guessing there might be questions about that or maybe comments or frustrations. <laughs> Doesn't seem to be any. Nothing yet. Okay. Nope. Just absorbing. Okay. Yeah. We have a couple more slides. We might people might have questions later. That's fine. Okay. Um, this is my last slide, um, and the purpose of this slide is to really go over. For so, for those of you who are looking at your ledgers, um, and that's part of your work, the way you see this information is going to change with UC Path data, and the fundamental change is that um, vacation and sick. PTO and other similar earn, earn code is the new name for DOS code. Those codes are going to be paying earn codes, which means when someone takes vacation, for example, the reg time is now going to be reduced 
by the amount of vacation that they took. So in today's world, you'll see just as though they worked 100% and then you'll see a secondary line recording the vacation, but you have everything on your reg line. That's not going to be true in the future. So this is not a literal report, but this is just um, trying to introduce that concept to you. So you can start thinking about um, and get ready for um, orienting yourself to how this data is going to appear in your ledgers in the future. So I have a um, comparison of a monthly and a biweekly report, uh, sorry, employee, and um, the salaries may not be realistic, but it helps us <laughs> do the math in our minds. So our monthly employee is 100% position, and in the future, uh, appointment percent is really recorded in FTE. So that 1.0 FTE really means they're 100% employee. They have an annual salary of 60,000, and their monthly is 5,000. Um, this is as though we're reading the ledger for October. So you can see here, we had our current period paid 5,000 in wages, but they on monthly, we record vacation and arrears. So in this example, in September, this employee took vacation. And so it, it, that September vacation gets recorded in the financials the, in October. And so it reduces the reg um, by the amount of the vacation taken. So you see that in your wages category. Um, so you still have, the sum is still the same, the sum is still 5,000, but now it's been distributed across those earned codes. You will still get that credit um, for the vacation taken, and that appears in your benefits category now, sub six. Um, uh, the CBR assessment will be assessed and um, the current vacation assessment will be assessed and those get recorded again in your benefits. So more rows, same bottom line. Um, and, and, and they end up in separate rows because again, monthly in the time is being recorded in arrears. Now in biweekly, it's a little bit different. So again, 100% employee, we're saying they're 120,000 again, just to make the math easier. Um, Monthly salary is 10,000. Um, and, and the ledger month in this example is September. So um, you can see here, um, now if we go down to the labor ledger data, that reg time has been reduced by the amount of vacation taken because in our biweekly, the vacation does get recorded in the same accounting month as the pay. So instead of like in monthly where we see a separate line for the decrement of reg, in Bi-weekly, it, it's invisible. And so um, it's important to know this because when you're re reconciling your ledgers and you see that 3750, you, I don't want you to think that, oops, this person hasn't, wasn't paid their full pay. It's because they took vacation. And so you do have to consider all of those earning codes rows for the reg and vacation to make up that full salary amount. Um, and CBR and VLA work the same. So. Um, you will have the 339 report. However, it won't be in FISDS anymore. It will now be in Cognos. It's being recreated in Cognos. Um, and so that's where you will find this information and, and that's the report where you will find um, all of this um, activity. So I know that was a mouthful, and a lot to think about, and it's okay. I mean, I think it's one of those things where you just kind of have to see it. And once you have your ledger in front of you, really digest it. But I really want to just introduce the concept to you now so that you know that there, a difference is coming. And, and so when it comes, um, you'll be able to recognize it. There are some questions as you expected. Yes. <laughs> All right, so let's get to the questions. Okay. Well. Open. Okay, so question one. In the meantime, how do I know who is paid on my accounts? You'll still get um, your, uh, like I said, the 339 replacement report in Cognos. You'll, you'll see all of your ledger actuals there. It just won't include encumbrances. All right, thank you. Is the new Cognos report classified as a high priority to be completed shortly after go live? I can't answer that um, because I don't think it has been prioritized yet. I think all of the reports that have by, been identified for day two, so post go live, um, to my knowledge, they haven't been um, prioritized yet. But rest assured, there are people on that report who are from departments. They do have research um, programs. And so um, if I looked into my crystal ball, I'm guessing this would be a pri high priority, but I don't know that and it has not been prioritized yet. It really depends on that committee, that report committee. Okay, thank you. 
I use the DS339 report to access salary and funding information. How would I get access to that information in UC Path? I don't work with payroll, so I would not automatically have access, have login access. So um, uh, um, an access um, request effort has happened coming out of the UC Path project. So um, our security team has gone out to um, I think it was Dean's offices and Dean's offices then promulgated it down to their departments and they identified who should have funding entry. So if you do, do you have the role of entering funding, salary cost transfers, and also who should have re, um, reporting access. So that has been requested uh, on your path. So I would say um, speak with your manager and if your manager isn't familiar, speak with your Dean's office and they will know if you have been put on the list. Awesome, thank you. How will this reg reporting impact ERS? Um, I don't know, this might be a James question. I, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I believe so. We, we will continue to have effort reporting, but not through the effort reporting system. Okay. The, um, the, the game plan is that we are going to move away from ERS and into a different type of reporting. Now that Uniform Guides no longer requires effort reporting, we're using this as a good ideal opportunity to look at a different solution to still maintain the compliance requirements, but not necessarily our quote unquote effort reports, which are, you know, um, very not as well understood as, as we would like. All right. Thank you, James. The CBR will not be assessed to leave to the leave assessment anymore. Is that the case with UC Pass? Um, that is not true. CBR does still, um, there is a liability pool that is associated with CBR. And so when someone, um, so when CBR is collected, um, it, it, the accounting part of it happens the same. It's just the, the rate structure that changes. The, the number of rates have changed. All right. How do I get access to Cognos? <laughs> um, Again, speak with your manager and see if you have, if, because we have gone out and, and done an access request um, initiative already. So um, if you're not familiar, aware if your name is on the list, speak with your manager. Your manager can work with the dean's office and they can um, let you know if your name has been put forward for the access to Cognos reporting. And if not, um, they can add you. Okay. So I think that this next request, this question is related, but I'm going to read it. Sure. It's my understanding that those of us who have enjoyed PPS access will not have direct access to this information in UC Path. So we will all be relying on these reports. How can I look up distribution information for people who are paid on my accounts for forecasting purposes? Um, one of the things that UC Path gives us is the ability to have access into the system on the finance side without having access to HR and payroll or sensitive information. So, you know, where I know access to PPS can be kind of sensitive because it gives you access to a lot of pages when really you, maybe you just want to know the funding distributions. Um, in UC Path, you, it is a separate security role, so you can just have access to the funding entry information. And furthermore, you can have inquiry access, you know, not even processing access. So that's something that you can definitely request so you can have access directly to the system. But I think for forecasting, it's really more efficient to have it through reporting. And so you would definitely want to have access to um, Cognos reports for, you know, for looking at um, large populations of people rather than, you know, one by one looking at folks. The yeah. last one is just a thank you for answering the question. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, um, as always, we're um, available for questions. I guessing this won't be the last time we come to present because this is really an introduction to sort of get you warmed up and then um, probably we'll be back as we, we get closer to go live and maybe even after go live. Um, so thank you, everyone. Oh, yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, will we be able to look up the citizen, citizenship slash visa status of employees as this is important to understand fee remissions? It is available in UC Path. What I don't know offhand is um, what access level grants you um, that information. So I'll have to take that away um, and find out how you, but it is available through UC Path. I even have, think it's probably available in a report. I just don't know who has access to that information. Maybe I should just stand up here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Okay, thank you, Maude. I have heard that the new 339 report in Cognos is not user-friendly, that you have to enter in a lot of information, unlike now when you can just enter in the ORG or account number. Is this the case? Um, my understanding is that the folks who have designed the report really tried to make it as close to the current 339 as possible. Um, I would say that the Cognos interface is very different, just like UC Path interface is very different than PPS. I think um, in terms of learning um, the navigation and how windows work um, is different. And I think like anything else, we'll learn it quickly. Um, but I, I do believe that the, um, the designers of that report are trying to make it as similar in terms of like the criteria that you need to get results back should be similar to what it is today. So Cognos will provide info for forecasting purposes of salary commitment? It does, we will not have salary commitment. Um, what we will have is, um, so in addition to the 339 report, which tells you how someone got paid, so it's um, looking back, we will also have a report of the funding entry. So you can get a report of what are the distributions in the system currently. So that could be leveraged for forecasting, but it won't be um, like a proper encumbrance report. I think that's it. Uh, your presentation brought five more people. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And also, I have been assured that there is no test after this because I am <laughs> suspecting that I wouldn't pass. Um, any other questions for anybody here? I don't see anything online. And if there's nothing here either, it's after 9.30, we can stop. Okay, thank you very much. See you next month.